Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we're into sort of a star formation feedback session now. Um, just a quick reminder, which I will keep reminding every day. Uh, please remember to upload your slides once you've given your talk or before if you would like. Um, especially for Monday's speakers, I think we only have three or four of them so far. Um, so please try to do that. Don't forget, just scroll to the bottom of the program and there's a link and instructions and everything there. Uh, yes. Um, it would be better if you do it as PDF. If it has videos and stuff and you want to do PowerPoint, also upload both and I can put both in as options. Um, but it's better if you at least have PDF. For one thing, all the talks are getting recorded, and so sometimes people might want to look at the recording and be able to scroll through a, and a PDF at least is format well, platform independent. So, so. Right. so our first talk will be Mark, who's going to talk about metal loading. So take it away. All right, thank you. I, I am using the mic because it's being recorded even though I don't need it. And I promise to violate all of the rules that you know we were taught at the uh, at, at, at the dinner, so I'm, I I will have jokes. You know, we're told don't do that, but I, I will have jokes, I promise. Um, all right, so, so let me start by acknowledging my collaborators, uh, your various people who have worked on the stuff I'm about to show you. Uh, Aditi Vijay and Ben Wibting or, and Chung Chung Hee are postdocs or were postdocs with me at ANU. Uh, John Forbes is a collaborator and former PhD student of mine uh, from Santa Cruz. So known to Room. Uh, Piyush was my PhD student at ANU, and Rung Zhang Huang was just finished his master's degree at ANU. But of course, since a lot of this work was done during the pandemic, I have to acknowledge that the most important collaborator of all, which is the cat. Yeah, see, see again, I, I'm violating the rules here. I had a joke, and I'm putting this in because it makes me appear cuter and less threatening. So, you know, I'm not establishing my power, I'm disestablishing my power. I just want you to notice this. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't name the cat. This was the shelter. This was the shelter name. Um, but my son wanted to keep it, so the cat is Jeff. All right, so let me give you the plan for the talk. We'll start with what is metal loading. I know this is known to many of you in the room, but for those who to whom it is not, um, I will explain what metal loading means, and I will talk about the evidence for it, both indirect and direct. All right, and then I'll talk about simulations that we've done to try and understand metal loading, and to look for observational evidence of it that we can predict from our simulations and then try and find in the real data. All right, and then I'll, I'll end with the obligatory future prospects for those who follow this All right, so, so here's part one of the talk. All right, th this is a baby echidna. For those who don't know what an echidna is, imagine an anteater fucks a porcupine. <laughs> there we go. That was another rule violation there. You know. um, this is an echidna. All right. So, so let's start with just the basic observations we want to explain about metals. The most famous here is, of course, the mass metallicity relation. More massive galaxies have higher metallicities, and depending on the calibration you use, there are much possible relations, the absolute for the absolute value in which one of these calibrations exactly is correct is a fight I don't want to have here. But regardless, there are clearly more metals and more masses. All right, and it's I think a very useful exercise, and this is this is from Molly Peoples work, to just sort of say, well, all right, how do the metals that I can account for relate to the total metals that a galaxy has produced? So if I look at the stellar mass, I think I know roughly the total mass of metals that should have been produced, and then I can try and account for how many of those metals can I see locked in stars, in gas, in dust. And the interesting thing is that even if you sum over all of the available metals, you see this trend that there are fewer of the available metals visible in all of the parts of the galaxy, in low mass galaxies. All right, so it's not just that the metals are predominantly in gas rather than stars, it's that the metals aren't in the disk of the galaxy at all. In low mass galaxies. All right, now, a final thing is that you can, of course, do more than just assign a single metallicity. We have these neat things called IFUs now, or so I'm told. And, I don't know. and apparently that lets you measure the metallicity gradient within a galaxy, and you find that there's this pattern of metallicity gradient versus stellar mass where it is 
deep at sort of intermediate masses and it gets shallower on both ends. In principle, you'd like to be able to explain things like that. Too. All right, so let's start with just, we, we won't even try for the gradient, let's start with just the simplest, dumbest model, which is a bathtub model. All right, and, and I'm very heavily borrowing from Molly Peoples' work here. So you have very simple relations. The stellar mass it increases proportional to the star formation rate with this recycling factor, 1 minus FR there, to account for the fact that not all the mass that goes into stars stays in stars for a long time. You have the gas mass, and you have loss of gas masses goes down with star formation. All right, it also goes down due to winds, and it is increased by accretion, and I'm realizing I probably have a sign error here, but don't worry about it. Um, and then, of course, you have metal mass, which goes up in proportion to the yield of metal. All right, so the key parameters appearing in these equations are the recycling fraction, how much of the mass that goes into stars comes back out immediately, the metal yield, the ratio of accretion rate to star formation rate, that is this eta accretion, and the ratio of wind mass loss rate to star formation rate, and that's this eta wind, the mass loading factor. And this is in a simple model where we just assume that the metallicity of the wind is the same as the metallicity of the mass. And you can solve these equations, eliminate eta accretion by rewriting everything in terms of the gas fraction, and you get this basic result, that the gas phase metallicity, mz over n gas, should be given by this expression proportional to yield, and it depends on the wind mass loading factor and this factor of order unity and the gas fraction. All right, so I'm not going to do the algebra for you. Trust me that, you know, you could do this algebra, or rather that Molly could do this algebra. And when you do this, now, the neat thing here is, right, this is a measurable thing, so this gas phase metallicity. This is a measurable thing, the gas fraction. This is, at least you think you know from theory of stellar evolution. And so you can try and back out, well, what does eta w have to be doing to match the observation? And when you do that, you discover that in order to reproduce this observation from this gas fraction, you need this eta w to scale incredibly steeply with virial velocity, like the fourth power of the virial velocity. All right, and you can understand this intuitively very, very simple, or it actually should be minus fourth power. Again, I have a sign error here. The way you can understand this very is easy. As you go from spiral galaxies like the Milky Way to dwarf galaxies, the gas fraction goes up, but the metallicity goes down by way more than the gas fraction goes up. And in order to explain that basic observation, what you have to hypothesize is that in dwarf galaxies, a lot of the metal-enriched ISM that the stars have dumped their metals into has been blown out of the galaxy and re been replaced with essentially pristine primordial zero metallicity gas. And that's how you explain why the metal fraction is so low in dwarf galaxies. I've basically taken all of the enriched ISM, thrown it away, and replaced it with newly accreted metal-free gas. That's how I get a low metal rate. Now, the problem is that essentially no wind model predicts a dependence this steep. No one gets a metallicity dependent, get, get a dependence on variable velocity. Here. All right, so how do we get out of this problem? Well, the answer is we give up the assumption that I implicitly smuggled into this bathtub model that the metallicity of the wind is the same as the metallicity of the gas. There's actually no good reason to assume that. All right, and if I relax that, I can solve the problem much more easily. So the way we normally parameterize this is one of, one of two parameters. So you say that the wind metallicity is equal to the gas phase metallicity plus some factor which is parameterized by this number C, which is a number between 0 and 1. And what this basically represents is if C is 0, then that's the conventional bathtub assumption that wind metallicity equals gas metallicity. And if C is 1, that basically says I take all of the newly synthesized metals produced by supernovae and I add them to the wind. None of them go into the galaxy itself. All right, another way that people parameterize this is with the parameter phi y, which is the yield reduction factor, and it's simply that I take the metal yield and I reduce it by a factor phi y. So phi y is 1, that's the conventional assumption that all of the metals go into the galaxy. If phi y is 0, that's the assumption that none of the newly synthesized metals go into the galaxy, they all leave in the world. All right, and so you can make, say, semi-analytic models where you allow this to flow freely, and that's what John Forbes has done here, you fit the mass metallicity relation, and what you find is that the model does not want C to be zero. The model greatly prefers that C be about 0.7, 0.8. 
All right, which corresponds to throwing a lot of the metals away. All right, you can also make analytic models, like this one from Sharda. I'm not going to have time to explain all of the logic that goes into this. But what I want you to focus on is just the colored points are the measurements of the mass metal with the gradient. And you can predict that the steepness of this relation depends on this phi y. If phi y is 1, you get this down here, which is a very steep relation. If phi y approaches 0, then you wind up up here. And you can see that the data want phi y to be close to 0 here, but it's working. All right, so you have this indirect evidence that winds are metal. What about direct evidence? Well, you can look at winds and ask, are they metal low? And you can do this in multiple ways. Here's one from Laura Lopez's work in the X. So this is M82. It's an X-ray image of it. And this is our poster child for the wind we can observe best because it's nearby and it's almost perfectly agile. So you can see the wind very clearly. And you can take an X-ray image and you can break it up into slices, as Laura has done here. And in each of these slices, extract the X-ray spectrum and then just fit what is the metallicity in each of these slices. And you can fit to the abundances of various elements, and you get results that look like this. Here's S versus Fe. And you notice that there's this huge enhancement in the metallicity for sulfur in the wind. And you see it for sulfur, you see it for oxygen, you see it for other alpha elements, and you don't see it for iron peak elements. All right, now that's a smoking gun that you're looking at stuff that has been enriched by type 2 supernova ejecta. You're looking at hot gas that has elevated alpha element abundances, because that's what type 2 supernovae make, and not elevated iron peak abundances, because those come predominantly from type 1. All right, so you have direct evidence in M82. You can also look at other galaxies, and instead of looking at the very hot gas and x-rays, you can look at the warm ionized gas that tends to four kelvin. So this is work from Cameron et al. from the Duvet survey. So this is the galaxy Markarian 1486, which is also nearly edge on, and here is the sort of picture. And you can look at the metallicity, and you see that there's clear enhancement of the metallicity off the plane and lower metallicity in the plane. Again, this is strong evidence for metal enrichment of galactic width. And I should say that this is a T-based metallicity diagnostic, so it's not a strong line calibration, which you might justly doubt in a wind. It's a much more direct. There's still systematic uncertainty, but it's pretty strong evidence that the metallicity is all right, so we've got this evidence. Can we reproduce anything like this? All right, so here's our, our cute baby quokka, for those who haven't seen this. This is the cutest animal on Earth. Baby in the pouch there. It is. It's just the cutest animal on Earth. All right, so we'd like to simulate. And it turns out that this is hard. Right? In, in principle, we'd like to have a first principle prediction of, say, C or phi y as a function of galaxy properties, as a function of escape speed, gas content, stellar content, whatever. But this is hard because fundamentally the physics that's going to dictate the metal loading is the mixing between the supernova ejecta, which are in this hot bubble, and the cooler gas around them. And if you're going to get this mixing anything like right, you need to actually resolve the set of Taylor phase of the expansion of a supernova. All right, if you are using a subgrid model for supernovae where you say, all right, well, I can't resolve the set of Taylor phase, so I'm going to treat this as momentum injection, you've lost the ability to say anything about where the metals wind up. All right, and that means that essentially you can't study this in cosmological simulations. Even the best resolved zoom in cosmological simulations with, say, a few thousand solar mass resolution are not resolving the set. So you just can't do this in cosmological simulation. You probably require parsec scale resolution in the hot gas. And this is important because it's a challenge for Lagrangian method. You need high resolution, not just following the mass. You need high resolution in the dilute hot gas because that's where all the metals are. You need to resolve the cold phase because you need to get mixing between the hot and cold stuff right. Again, you probably want to use an Eulerian method because if you are using a Lagrangian method, you need a subgrid prescription for mixing because Lagrangian methods don't naturally do mixing, and that's actually the physics you want to capture. All right, you need a simulation domain that goes at least a few kiloparsecs off the disk if you want to be able to compare to observations like the one of M82 I showed you. 
you need to run for times of order at least 100 million years to let your wind reach steady state. And, and this is hard. The computa this, is, you know, this list of computational requirements should make you cry if you do simulation. So in order to meet this challenge, we have produced this new code called SWAT, the Quadrilateral Umber-Producing Orthogonal Kangaroo-Conserving Code for Astrophysics. Now, I will, I will say two things about this name. One is that blame Ben Whitking, it's his fault. All right, and two, your natural question, of course, is kangaroo conserving? Well, I guarantee that running this code does not change the number of kangaroos. It therefore conserves kangaroos. This should be obvious. So what is Quokka? Quokka is a new open source GPU optim optimized adaptive mesh refinement radiation hydrogen. All right, so key things, key features. We've got hydrodynamic multi-group radiation transfer, gravity, supernova injection, primordial chemistry. By next year, we'll have ideal MHD, thinking star particles, modern chemistry, photochemistry. It runs on GPUs. It has AMR. It's open source. Those are the key things to take away. Oh, and of course, the most important one, it's really fucking cheap. All right, so for those who, to whom this figure is meaningful, we achieve, on a V100, we achieve well over 100 million zone updates per CPU per second. All right, so let me tell you about some results. All right, so we are using Quokka to do the QED simulation suite, which is a series of simulations of galactic here to study metal loads. So we have large boxes, at one by one by eight kpc at least, sufficient for the wind to develop. We have at least two parsec resolution everywhere in the volume. Sometimes we go higher. We have run times of at least 150 mega years, and we have a wide range of gas and stellar surface densities, metallicities, and gas fractions. So supernovae are injected randomly. We don't have self-consistent star formation implemented yet. That's coming. But the key feature is our subgrid model is when a supernova goes off, we dump 10 to the 51 ergs and a solar mass of oxygen into the cell, and that's it. That is our subgrid model for supernova. The first paper is out. Papers two and three are in preparation. And you may ask, what does QED stand for? Well, put our demonstratum, which is, and I'll, I'll just let you read this. And 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 uh, this I take the blame for. And I think it's best. The response you should have is best summarized by an anonymous poster on on my Slack channel, um, who who said that the full title was "Impresses, Amuses, and Angers." Me. All right. So so what is one of these simulations? Well, I'll just show you a movie of just one of them. All right, so top panel is density, bottom panel is oxygen, or middle panel is oxygen density, and then bottom panel is metallicity. All right, and you can see what metal loading looks like. The fact that the stuff that's going out does not have the background metallicity at minus two. All right, and I'll just let that play so you can see what, these what one of these simulations does, it speeds up as it goes along. Um, and this is the sort of output we have. And you can measure the mass flux in the different phases. All right, so we, we have temperatures from 10 Kelvin to 10 to 7 Kelvin. We have a range of metallicities, and you can just measure everything about the wind coming out of this galaxy. All right, and, and you can see that, I mean, there's yellow stuff going out of the box, right? And that yellow stuff is metal-enhanced. All right, so you can be quantitative. You can ask, well, what, what is phi? You can focus on the orange line at 3 kpc. This is phi y. And it is indeed about 0.7, which is what the indirect inferences seem to suggest you need. All right, this is a function of background metallicity. Um, you can dice it up into, you know, well, what's carrying the mass versus the metal? So here's mass flux versus metal flux in the different phases. You can ask about densities in different phases, and I won't take the time to go through this in detail. But you can dice this up and check all sorts of things. Now, can you check this any any of this observation? All right. And the answer is yes. So here's what imperfect metal mixing looks like. The key feature that you're going to notice is you have cool gas, which is metal poor, and hot gas, which is metal rich. And the hot the metallicity of the hot gas varies with height. It's high down here and lower here. You can do simulated observations in the X-ray. And when you do that, here's some synthetic X-ray spectra. You can analyze it exactly as Laura Lopez does. 
And here's what you get, exactly the signature she sees of it's metal rich here, and it gets more and more metal poor as you go out. And the physics that's driving this is simply that near the galaxy, it's the most imperfectly mixed, and you're looking at almost pure ejecta. As you go away from the galaxy, some of the cold material evaporates into the hot phase and dilutes it, the metallicity returns to closer to average. So this gradient, where it's high metallicity near the plane and falls off away from the plane, is a smoking gun for this process. All right, and in fact, you can invert this gradient to learn about mixing between the phases. All right, so I am, I am out of time. I have to show you, you know, here's the last cute Australian baby animal picture. All right, and in, I think in the interest of time, I am going to skip ahead and just say, we've done this with just oxygen, but there's no reason we have to be limited to oxygen. So this is not a done in quokka, this is done in gizmo, but we are now porting this into quokka. We have all of our different elements being injected differentially by individual stars, and so we can look at how this pattern differs for things that are produced in type 2 supernovae versus AGB stars, versus type 1A, versus neutron stars. And we can actually start to do this element by element. I think I will end. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is really convincing, and actually I'm convinced by that. And uh, my question is the following. You have a strong metalloging factor that probably means that you have a lower mass loading factor involved. Yeah. As a result, it's going to have implications on models that count on very high mass loading factors to explain uh, the universe today. So how do you think we can reconcile this? Right. So that's an excellent question, and I don't know the answer yet because we have not finished the full suite, so I, I can show you what the metal loading factor is for that one run, but I, I don't have the full parameters that I've explored yet. But yeah, I agree that the mass loading factors probably need to come down a little bit. Mostly it's the dwarfing. I, I think in some ways that's maybe a little bit easier. I think one of the real tensions that a lot of the models that have super high mass loading factors have is making all dwarfs be gas rich. They are observed to be. Right? You can't throw away all the gas because if you go to a dwarf, it's got 10 times the mass of gas that it's got its stars. So I think that problem will actually get a little bit easier if the mass loading factor is going to be quite Hi, this is really cool. I, you, you show there that the metals tend to, you have that large peak in the metallicity close to the disk, uh, and as you go further out it gets, and, uh, yeah. Is that where most of the metals stay? Or do they eventually kind of fill up the halo? No, so they're not saying they're leaving the galaxy. The reason the metallicity in the hot phase is going down is not that the metals are leaving the hot phase. It's simply that you're mixing cold gas into the hot phase, and so you're diluting it. So all the metals that are in the hot phase at the plane are still leaving the galaxy. It's just that the hot phase gains a bunch of metal to our mass from cold stuff that gets mixed into it, and so the metallicity of the hot phase goes down. If you actually look at the metal flux in the hot phase, all right, that's not going down much with height, right? That's this, this red line. It's getting a little bit of the metal flux leaving the hot phase and going into the, the other phases, but not much. It's very weak. Stuff. So mostly that decrease in metallicity that you're seeing is simply dilution. It's not metal not going out. Thanks. Maybe Richie can come set up. Oh, we have one last question. This is great, thank you. Uh, so you said that it's important to resolve the off uh, stage to launch uh, winds properly. I was wondering if you change the resolution to see if there is effect on the uh, metal loading in your simulation. Yeah, so we actually did a resolution study in that paper. and. You're converged from going from four to two parsec resolution. You're relatively well converged. If you start going to worse resolution than that, the answer changes. So at least for this simulation, sort of two parsecs is about what you four to two to four parsecs is about what you need to get converged. Okay, so because the cosmological simulations they all uh, they also produce metal rich winds, but the the result is that uh, the metal loading is actually incorrect because they're not converted. Yeah, I, I don't think they're they're capturing the physics properly. Just that okay. I don't think you can get the resolution you need in a cosmos. 
maybe in a simulation of like an ultra metal poor dwarf where you just don't have that many particles, so in like coral wheelers work. So you may be able to do that, but I don't think any other. All right, let's thank Mark once more.